actually, I just want to start off with um, a good evening and um, thank you to Kamal and Philippe and the entire ADVAC team for inviting me today. ADVAC is, um, is rather, rather legendary in immunization, and this is my first time in ANSI, so it's a real privilege and an honor to be here with you. And I know you're here and you're learning about, um, you all have strong backgrounds in immunization and you're sharing your experiences with your peers. But um, you're also really important leaders in this field. You're important leaders today, and you really are incredibly important leaders for tomorrow. So part of my comments are really framed in that spirit. Uh, Kamal asked me to speak about our immunization delivery work at the Gates Foundation, how it's evolved over time and what we're excited about, what we're worried about. So I'm actually going to be fairly frank and honest with you about some of the opportunities and challenges we're seeing. And before um, just getting into the presentation, I just also want to acknowledge that, um, and some of you may have heard this expression, but that we're operating in what's known as a VUCA world. It's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex, and it's ambiguous. And I think that's really particularly true um, as we think about and has real implications for immunization. I think there's also two additional backdrops, which I'm not really not going to spend any time on, but I think are really important for us to consider as well. One is around climate change, and the other is actually about the macroeconomic fiscal challenges facing many, many, many countries um, that started before the pandemic and really were exacerbated in the pandemic. And I'll touch on some of the things we're seeing, but um, I just wanted to set that background. But... Um, Maybe as some of you know, um, the foundation is really guided by the principle that every life has equal value. And we really focus our work on the areas of greatest need for where there's the greatest impact and in the way we can do the most good. And whether it be in agriculture, education, health, we really seek to improve the quality of people's lives. Now, for those of you who may be less familiar um, with the foundation, I thought I'd just uh, give you a little bit of a snapshot of 2021 here. Um, you'd think I'd have the data for 2022, but I don't. Um, but basically, just overall, we, we currently have around 2,000 grants um, working in 144 countries, all 50 U.S. states, over a 1,000 grantees, we uh, had a payout of just under seven billion last year. Um, that will go up this year, and we have just under eighteen hundred employees. The critical number, actually two critical numbers. One is the two thousand one hundred six of Gates Foundation alumni, of which we include Kamal, um, and then the program strategies. We're organised uh, according to teams. Each team has a program strategy. So Keith Plugman in the back leads our pneumonia and pandemic preparedness group. I lead immunisation. There's a polio team. There's an agricultural team. A financial services for the poor team, and we each develop a strategy, share that with um, our co-chairs every year, including progress. And then based on that approval of strategy, we get permission to make grants um, as we move forward. So that's an important part. Uh, I just really just threw this one up as just a, basically just focusing on the first two for a minute. The global development is where the downstream work sits. Polio, we're big supporters of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. Gavi still is our major largest investment. And this is where my work sits in immunization. Um, as does primary health care and polio. Global health, we're represented here by Keith Klugman, um, is where our research and development work is, and it's, uh, you know, really a very large part of what we do. And then we have other programs as well you may not be as familiar with, financial services, education, etc. And we also have a new gender team. So I just wanted to set the stage a little bit before jumping up into um our work on immunization specifically. I'm actually going to turn now to 1997. And here, just to say that the founding of the foundation is integrally tied to vaccines. And it actually all started around a desire about rotavirus. This was an article published by Nicholas Kristoff, a New York Times journalist, that really got Bill and Melinda thinking. They were new parents at the time. And here was a, a Children were dying of rotavirus diarrhea for which we had a tool and a technology. And that really drove everything that we do at the foundation today um, in thinking about how we can make vaccines accessible, reachable, usable um, to communities. But I also want to say that rotavirus has also been a humbling experience for us. 
Um, in 2007, um, a, a, colleague, a colleague of ours, Steve Landry, who some of you may have the privilege of knowing, who recently retired from the foundation, and I were asked to accompany Bill and Melinda on a trip to Vietnam to look at immunization. And one of the frustrations at the time was that rotavirus, while we had a great vaccine, the packaging, single-dose presentation packaging, just wouldn't fit in a, even in a vaccine carrier. So here all this work had gone into designing something that simply wasn't going to be usable. So we got to a clinic, and I was actually trying to look for the photos, but I didn't find them. And um, we handed Bill the, the box of rotavirus um, vaccine and said, well, look, here's a health worker heading out on outreach. You know, let's put it in the box. Well, of course, it didn't fit. Well, you could sort of wedge it in, but you weren't getting anything else in. And he turned around to us and he said, well, what idiot didn't think of that? And it was us. It was all collectively us. And I think it's really brought about how important it is that we think at every turn what we're developing. Um, actually, we think about healthcare workers. We think about um, the clients and the people that we need to serve and what makes it most be best. Now, I would love to say that we've learned a lot from this and that we haven't made those mistakes in the foundation. I think we all continue to make those those challenging errors. But I think this is one of the real take home messages for us. Um, I'm now going to shift to a little bit. Oops, oh, that, oh, that was the wrong one. There we go. I told you I was challenged. I'm actually just going to talk a little bit. I'm going to race through these because I know I'm between you and dinner. Um, of, uh, this is just a little bit. I'm just going to talk very briefly about uh, the immunization team, how we're, we're structured and what we work on. Our focus on the immunization delivery is how we support the delivery of high quality, affordable vaccines to ensure equitable coverage. We have a vaccine access team that focuses a lot on, on healthy markets, vaccine supplies, where a lot of our work on cold chain equipment um, and supply chains happens. We have our vaccine programs team really focused on how to accelerate the introduction and scale up of Gavi supported vaccines. Um, Tanya, who's here, is on that team. Um, we, so this is really around, we have programs in um, typhoid and cholera, uh, meningitis, and we're also PCV rota, but we're also looking forward, anticipating maternal immunization, new challenges, new frontiers. Our immunization platforms team is really focused at how do you reach actually zero-dose children? How do we reach adolescents? What are the barriers to the uptake of delivery? And once again, this isn't the Gates Foundation. We work obviously with partners, many of you in this room, and we're always delighted to do that. We have a fourth program called Routine Immunization Strengthening in High-Risk Polio Areas, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but that's really um, looking at really strengthening routine and at sub-national level in about 10 countries. We have a very strong advocacy and communications work where we try and build and keep the momentum for immunization in the eyes of donors who can be quite fickle um, at times, and also to keep the profile of immunization high at the country level. But the biggest investment we have is Gavi. And I know you had a lecture from um, Aurelia uh, probably earlier this week and know everything you want to know about Gavi, but I would be re remiss if I didn't say that this is the single biggest investment we've ever made at the foundation. Um, and remain so. We are big supporters of Gavi. And I think what's important to remember with Gavi is it really was established to accelerate new vaccine introduction, to reduce the time lag in the introduction of vaccines from developed to developing countries, which used to be in the case of hepatitis B, 30 years, now down you know, to almost simultaneous. Pneumococcal 13 was introduced in Canada and Sierra Leone within two months. And we heard from um, Melanie earlier about COVAX, although I think there's some real lessons of COVAX of things we should probably think about better. But we haven't been totally successful. HPV was licensed in developed countries in 2006, and we're only now just being able to scale it up for a whole lot of good reasons. But I think the partnership of industry, of countries, of Gavi, um, donors, the private sector research is going to be absolutely critical. What Gavi wasn't designed to do was improve coverage. And I think this is actually something that we all collectively really need to think about and reflect on. Um, coverage has been a challenge. It really suffered during COVID, and we'll talk about that in a second. 
And I know, oops, sorry, I got it again. Um, Aurelia, I think, must have talked about the tremendous growth in what Garvey has supported and the lives saved. I think the point I'm going to make, and I'm going to make it in a minute too, is we're moving out of the land of pediatrics now into the land of adolescents and adults, and this is creating new challenges. And I think you've probably talked a lot about that over the past couple of days. I think on COVID, um, the pandemic was absolutely devastating in many ways. Um, but I think, you know, and, but as Melanie said earlier, you know, the rapid deployment of the COVID vaccine was really impressive. I think her point, though, that I really want to underscore is the that we built on the years and years of R&D that went into the development and the science that allowed this to happen, which is, I think, why we at the foundation see such an important role for R&D here. Um, you know, and I think while we all formed quickly to form COVAX and to accelerate, the pa pandemic also showed the cracks in our immunization system. At a time of scarcity, we should have been planning better for delivery. We didn't. We saw vaccine nationalism. It was appalling. It was a dreadful, you know, none of us can look at ourselves in the face and be honest that that was a successful moment in time. So there are lots of lessons from COVAX. And I think, you know, Melanie outlined many of them of what we need to do and do better before the next pandemic. But I think one of the most startling things in, for the um, implications of COVID-19 was obviously the number of zero-dose children, children who've never reached vaccines, went to a skyrocketing high of 25 million. And I know Kate O'Brien later this week will talk more about that. As we enter... Um, uh, a new era. I just want to sort of talk about a few things that we're thinking about, and I would actually welcome your thoughts and inputs. Um, the exciting news is that we have, as you've probably learned over the last few days, a week, a lot of vaccines coming down uh, the road. But the challenge is how do we really navigate expanding vaccine schedules, new age groups, and groups we don't necessarily know how to reach well, like adolescents. I, I really want to bring in here also increasing macroeconomic conditions and I, I was struck recently Ghana, which is really one of has one of the strongest immunization programs, is currently facing a forty five percent inflation rate. Their currency is one of the worst performing in the world today, and they're really waiting on a three billion dollar uh, IMF loan um, package. For a country that has never had stockouts, they've had stockouts. We will start to see this in other countries unless we really think about how we take action. Countries really are starting to struggle of how they pay for vaccines. This is something we also need to think about at a time as well when donor funding is going down and fiscal pressures on countries are high. And we also need to think about the big pressure on health systems to deliver more to more individuals. And yet we have health workers who are under-resourced. There aren't enough and they're um, and uh, and overworked. I think some of the other shifts we're seeing that I just, oh, and here is, I think, this vaccine pipeline. It's an incredibly exciting story of what's coming. Um, it's a real testament to the R&D and the work that's underway. Um, but we're going to have to work really hard to make sure that everyone has access to those um, to those products as we move forward. I think one of the changes we're also starting to see um, is a, a very big change in vaccine markets post-COVID. And, you know, I think we're starting to see the evolution of more specialized niche vaccines, dengue, um, uh, even malaria, one could talk about as a niche vaccine because it's not applied everywhere as it was with, with some of our other vaccines. We're starting to see decentralized regional buying. And that means, means when you sort of break up procurement, you tend to actually start to get higher costs we're seeing a broader range of new vaccines. That's more increased spending. And we're seeing a diversification of manufacturing, which is really wonderful to see. But there's also comes with that a reduced economy of scale. As always, there's a trade off here. And so that's going to be some important things. And the bottom line is vaccines risk actually getting more expensive in the next few years. And so that's something to navigate as well. I talked earlier about how the pandemic had settled. Was that my bell? Help. I'm going to move quickly then. We'll go global immunization. I'm going to show you this one. This is one of the challenges we are also seeing. I'd love your thoughts. We're hearing from our grantees and health workers that uh, there's so many vaccines at the age of 6, 10, and 14 weeks that it's overwhelming. And I think there's a real challenge here. Uh, 
we're basically seeing the fear of multiple injections, presentation matters. We're obviously funding work on combinations. Um, and op look, but it's a real call for us to think about optimizing schedules and where we go. This is, uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about trust. I think we lost a lot of trust over the COVID pandemic. I think it's a huge issue. And there's someone much wiser than me said progress moves at the pace of trust. And I think this is a critical area for us to focus on as a, as a group. I'm going to fly through the next few slides here. Um, I think in addition, I just want to show you very quickly in our immunization team, we track ourselves against these three goals. The eradication of polio is not in 2030. It's next year, but we fo focus on averting 16.2 million deaths between now and 2030. The bulk of those deaths will come from HPV from measles, improving the nine month touch point, improving campaign quality and reducing the number of zero dose children and reaching them with pentavalent vaccine, pneumococcal and rotavirus. And the reduction in zero dose children obviously is well known to all of you. It's an IA2030 goal. We measure ourselves against that. In addition to our work sponsoring Gavi, we have four areas that we are actually um, increasing our focus on now. One is reaching zero dose children. It's becoming increasingly clear that zero dose children don't always live in the far reaches of a far. They're very often in urban settings. Most live within a kilometer of a health facility. So we've seen interesting work. And I think Wahid here can talk about work in Baluchistan, but um, in Af Afghanistan, simply by installing a bathroom, a latrine, a security agent can increase uh, access that we haven't seen before. Accelerating HPV vaccines. I know you heard from the guru of all gurus this morning. We are at the foundation beyond excited about the HPV vaccine one dose. Um, we're very pleased to be supporting the, the work to, to get one dose um, trials uh, documented. But we also see enormous challenges in how do we reach adolescents? How do we improve coverage? And more importantly, how do we reach out of school girls? We've never done that. It's a really hard age group, but this is an area we're really leaning in on. Measles um, obviously work on microarray patches uh, on the R&D side, but really how do we improve the nine month touch point and how do we improve uh, campaign quality? And then our routine immunization strengthening in high risk polio districts, I'm just going to march through these, um, is really our work in places like Pakistan, Afghanistan, Chad, CAR, uh, Guinea. And I know some of you are here and who can speak to this more. This is a program we're very excited about. Um, in building routine immunization systems with local governments and with non-state actors in non-government accessible areas. I mean, obviously, we see our responsibility to use our resources um, to create a world where everyone has a healthy, productive life. Um, and I think in, in this, I'm actually really calling on you. Um, as I said at the beginning, your voice and leadership really matters. Your leaders today, your leaders tomorrow. And I really hope, um, one, that you will, you know, share feedback with the likes of me and other donors as we're thinking about what's important in immunization. But I also hope you're going to think of yourselves as change makers in immunization. And I also believe that the key for the future, given the very difficult challenges ahead, is partnership, collaboration and being really open to new opportunities and working with new people in new ways. And so... At a time when people have really lost a bit of trust, where we have fiscal constraints, vaccines are more than important than ever, but they don't deliver themselves and ensuring them that they can be delivered at the right time, the right place, the right temperature is critical. So once again, I really um, welcome this opportunity. I'm sorry for going over. I know that's a bad here, um, but I can't say how delighted I am enough, how delighted I am to be here and uh, really look forward to hearing your thoughts and questions. And the future of immunization is yours. So thank you. So we have, uh, we have some time for questions. It's the end of the day, and people are exhausted. Santosh. Thank you. I'm Santosh from WHO. Thank you for this very insightful presentation. Maybe just two quick questions. One is uh, the foundation's engagement of working with the countries. Does it work directly with the countries? You said you mentioned it more, more through the partners, right? So uh, just in terms of engagement with the countries and the vision for polio eradication, what's the foundation's vision of polio eradication? I'm uh, just looking forward to it. 
Great. Should I take a couple of questions and then well, how you should I do it? Yeah, just respond. Okay. okay. Foundation, we mostly work through partners. More recently, we've actually established offices in, well, we've had an India office for about 20 years. So we work directly with the government of India. We also have offices now in Nigeria and Ethiopia, where we have direct partnerships with the governments there. Um, but most of our work is indeed through partners. I would say uh, with the RISP work, um, that's actually working directly with subnational level in uh, DRC, for example, in Hotlomami and Tanganyika provinces, but also in conjunction with partners. So we do, beyond the three big countries, we don't necessarily have a field presence, but our work is very much about collaboration and partnership. Polio eradication is uh, one of our absolute top priorities at the foundation. We're very bullish on polio eradication. We must eradicate polio. I think what we recognize it's tough times right now, but I think what we're seeing, and you'll hear more from Ananda, I think what is exciting is that we've gone down from a sort of a genetic diversity of around eight strains down to two. So we're closing in on the virus, and what we really need to do now is be absolutely vigilant and deliver to the last mile. So I think this is a time when sometimes people are fatigued and tired. This is the time we really need to lean in and finish the job. And I think there's a ton we can learn from polio, a ton of lessons we can extrapolate to routine immunization, and this is the time to do it. So, no, at the Hi, May Rashil from the University of Sydney. Thank you for a great talk. Um, you, I think you briefly alluded. I'd love to hear your thoughts on where you see the priorities in health system strengthening are through, I guess, better campaigns or polio campaigns that you, I think, alluded to. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about where you think priorities in health system strengthening or immunization system strengthening might be. Yeah, I mean, that's the $300 million question, really, isn't it? Um, you know, I... I think that, that, you know, complex um, systems problems require systems solutions. And so, yes, we can focus on immunization system improvements, and we do. We focus on better cold chain, better supply chain. But I think some of the things that we need to tackle in the health system space are about the remuneration and payment of healthcare workers, um, standard guidelines, sort of the systems investments that need to happen at a, a bigger level. I think in immunization, what we're seeing in the campaigns in measles, polio, is more financial mobile money, direct payment to workers. So we're seeing that as an, an area to pilot things that can be then taken up to scale. My own personal view is that if we can't deliver immunization, we don't have a hope of delivering other more complex services. I mean, as much as I love immunization, it is about the simplest of all the primary health care programs. Um, and if we can't deliver it, what are we doing? So I see immunization as being a pathfinder for sure. And I think there's a lot we can learn. I think on where I think we need to really think about when we do polio and measles is how do we, they've become sort of separate and siloed now from the healthcare system itself. We've often taken healthcare workers away. We've let, got in the land of per diems. I think we're going to have to do a lot of work to get ourselves back out of that and back focused on routine immunization. I think there's also a big move now to how do we think about health systems? We've got Global Fund investing in health systems, Gavi investing in health systems, but the biggest um, investors in health systems are countries themselves. And at a time when there really are fewer fewer resources, how can we make things more efficient? Are there ways to do things more efficiently? So I think this is, for me, the critical area. And it's why I said at the beginning, Gavi wasn't designed to do health system strengthening. Neither was Global Fund. Um, so how do we think about health system strengthening in a, in a way that lands? Because I think that's the big challenge moving forward. Anyway. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, uh, Emmanuel from uh, Uganda, and I work with PATH. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for this presentation and uh, for sharing with us. Um, Related to the question that you actually responded to, in terms of the systems, I, I mean, we are seeing more of the need for integration, the need for, uh, you know, kind of working on the entire health system. I mean, when you talk about HPV, yes, we are trying to reach the girl uh, in the village who is not going to school, but, you know, the majority of these are actually at school. And so if we improve the education system, then we might actually get them. So I don't know how your approaches are in terms of uh, integration and looking at the entire health system, I mean, uh, as a whole system, not just on the 
immunization so that then we can indirectly improve on uh, immunization outcomes. Thanks. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, I think integration is absolutely critical. But I think with integration, well, two, two points I want to make. One is integration doesn't mean that we blend everything into one. You know, we still have our immunization. We should still be delivering A and C. And I think this is one of the strengths of the risk program uh, is actually it's not just going or increasingly polio. It's not just going in delivering polio drops. It's also going in and delivering other services and commodities and not just vaccines. So nutrition, I think we've got to do better at that. But I think we've so siloed our funding windows. We've got to break those down. So I'm really encouraging that we actually do much more. We, we see a tremendous opportunity to work more with education. And I think this is really critical around HPV for sure. Um, but I think we're, we're sometimes, I think we're a little bit blinkered in our world that we think because we're funded to do something, that's the only thing we should do. I think we should continue to push the envelope, but integration is hard. And I think it means everybody giving up a little piece of something. Um, but I think it's really the frontier of where we need to go. So I don't disagree with you. Um, but I have more failures of integration than I have examples of success right now. I would love to see more examples of success. Um, I've seen it in agriculture with livestock vaccination and child vaccination, but it tends to be one-offs. It isn't sustained. And I think that's the, the real key. I think it's the key when we do our zero dose work um, collectively is what actually gets sustained, that it isn't a one-off time to do things. So really welcome all your ideas here as well, because I think that's critical. Liana. Hi, I'm Liana. I work as a scientist at ICMR India. So, uh, Everybody talks about immunization coverage. The one thing that concerns me is the routine zero surveillance of the vaccine coverage of the country, for which uh, laboratory diagnostics are very crucial, especially this multiplex testing. So uh, what is the role if foundation is working on that? That's my first question. And my second question is, we have had a lot of infrastructural development that we have put in forward for COVID-19. How can we repurpose it for uh, the future, and especially TB, which is uh, up for elimination? Thank yeah. you. So surveillance is absolutely critical. And I think surveillance is one of those areas which is everyone's problem and no one's problem. But the foundation, we absolutely believe very, very deeply and strongly in surveillance and are investing, in fact, um, in India to sort of bolster um, some of the capacity. I think we've really got to see much more of this. My hope is that with the work on pandemic preparedness as well that's happening in the global with the vac pandemic vaccine pool with the pandemic fund at the world bank we're going to see more investments in surveillance but it's absolutely been under resourced to date uh, couldn't agree with you more in terms of repurposing funding from covid19 this is actually an interesting political question for us at the gates foundation it's a little bit easier um because we're seeing that you know everything is a continuum but for some donors whose funding was given as extra budget from their parliaments, it is purely restricted to COVID-19. And this is proving to be an enormous challenge right now for many governments because they would like to be able to invest in surveillance, in pandemic preparedness, but it's making that connection that's going to convince parliamentarians, whether they be senators, Republicans in the US or in, in Europe, so that's the challenge that everyone is facing right now, how to make that case and make it sing and land. Um, so work in progress, I would say. So last question, Farzana. Uh, I'm also from India, Farzana. Uh, my question is again back to polio. Uh, the world has seen many challenges uh, in, the, like, in the polio eradication program. Uh, now also we are thinking of NOPV or uh, any other. So my question is that what's your take on any other different kind like strategies we need to think of, like uh, for the for like for eradication and like like touching the last mile. So on I think tomorrow the next day Ananda is coming. Okay. Yeah, we'll have a session on polio. And you're going to have days. a session on polio oh, and, and, yeah, okay, and hold your questions. Yes. But I think for me, I think we still have a lot of lessons to we can learn from polio. 
um, that we need to really integrate. I, I think, you know, polio made a big shift when they stopped talking about coverage and started focusing out on missed children. And I think that's what we're doing in routine immunization now collectively. I think that's a big step forward. But I think it's going to be about integration, as um, uh, the gentleman there said. We, we, we can't keep delivering 20, 24 doses to children and not delivering any other services. We all know that. Um, so we need to basically think about how we are actually delivering integrated composite services and reaching our eradication goals because polio eradication would be an amazing achievement for a world that's gone seriously awry. So our commitment to that is deep and strong.